I'm very happy to uh, share this book with you. Um, I'll talk about the book in a little bit, uh, not immediately. Um, I'm really, really happy that um, some of the finest, bravest organizations in this valley uh, agreed to help co-sponsor uh, the event. And uh, if you've got this really beautifully made souvenir, uh, it has the names of the organizations uh, on it. Uh, you know, the struggle that we are in the middle of will not be won uh, by books like this alone, but by brave people who build organizations. So I'm very proud and happy and thankful uh, for these groups uh, in this valley. Uh, I'm, uh, of course, greatly pleased to be standing right in front of Francis, uh, who is the, uh, the pillar of so many of these groups. So thanks for coming here. When I thought about how uh, to present this book to you, uh, the immediate thought was that we'd have people read from the book. Um, and rather than have me read six pieces from the book, which would be appalling, uh, I'm very happy to have uh, some of the brightest lights uh, in this region uh, share the words from this book uh, you know, uh, for us to us, bring them to life. Um, when Juno Diaz uh, forward was uh, on my mind, I couldn't think of anybody else, uh, not only in this valley, but perhaps in these very fine United States of America. I couldn't think of anybody else uh, to read it uh, than our own uh, Monty. So Monty, would you like to come and read some Juno Diaz for us? Monty, come on. I'm totally humbled to be here in this company, and I'm humbled that BJ would ask me, and humbled to be here in the presence of the pillar, Francis Crow, Vice Pillar Pocky Wheeland, I believe, is uh, running for Vice Pillar. <laughs> From forward, Americans are so deranged about Palestine by Juno Diaz. I grew up in the 80s in central New Jersey, and every single kind of colonial settler calamity was present in my community. I was friends with an Irish kid, the only white kid in our community, and a hardcore Irish Catholic, Republican. His family used to pass the hat around in church to raise money for the IRA. My other friend was an Egyptian kid whose family extended into Palestine. And throughout the 80s, while everyone else was watching John Hughes movies, this kid had me on point on Palestine. And then, of course, this was at the height of the apartheid movement, so all of my African-American friends well, two of them, not all of them, had parents who were part of the left-wing pro-ANC anti-apartheid movement. I'm in this poor community, and this is all just getting beamed into my head. So by the time I was in college, I could give you chapter and verse on anti-Zionist projects. And look, for many people, it's a really tough issue. It's like we've kind of gotten deranged so that there are certain areas we can't discuss and of course, the situation in Palestine is an utter taboo in this country. Our ideas of terrorism, our ideas of Arabs are oversaturated with the most negative, weirdly perverse, racist ideologies. I can't even turn on the news for five seconds without hearing the most racist shit about Arabs or Muslims. And so in that kind of atmosphere, it's just a shouting match. If you say, I think the occupation of Palestine is fucked up on 40 different levels, People are like, you're the devil. We're going to get your tenure taken away. We're going to destroy you. You can say almost anything else. You can be like, I eat humans. <laughs> and they'll be like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> On the basic, basic level, if you're occupying other people's shit, guess what? You are fucked up. That's that. And that's a tough thing for people to stomach. Because we live in a country that's currently occupying people's fucking land. Perhaps Americans are so deranged about Palestine because Americans are thinking, if we give up here, these fucking Indians are going to want their shit back. Well, maybe they should get their shit back, since 90% of us don't own anything. I don't know how much it would hurt us. Thanks. Thank you.
beautiful, beautiful. Uh, ben Ehrenreich, who is uh, a very fine journalist, uh, some of you may know his writings from um, the LA Times. Uh, he's writing a book now about his travels in uh, the West Bank and Gaza. Um, he wrote a beautiful piece for the book about his travels in Gaza, and I thought for this, uh, you know, City Councilor Elisa Klein, who has traveled extensively uh, in the Middle East, knows the Middle East as well as anybody, uh, would be the best voice to channel Ben Ehrenreich. Uh, Elisa, please, thank you. out of the city until there were open fields and olive groves on both sides of the road. We passed abandoned gas stations and idle factories. Muharram Fuad worked on a small plot of land, turning over the soil with a short-handled hoe. He wore Adidas track pants, the knees dark with dirt. His wife sat cross-legged on the ground a few yards away, a child in her lap. Fuad had owned a house near here, he said, but the Israelis bulldozed it on the second day of Operation Cast Lead in December 2008. More than 3,000 Gazan families lost their homes in that brief and one-sided war. 13 Israelis and 1,400 Palestinians, mostly civilians, were killed. Since then, Fuad and his family have lived in a mud-walled hut. His wife was pregnant. The land he was tilling wasn't his. He was paid 20 shekels a day to farm it, he said, a little less than six dollars. He used to work in the tunnels and made nearly four times as much. The child stood at Fuad's feet, sucking a finger and clinging to his leg. Fuad smiled. It's like life below zero, he said. Far to the north, a white balloon hung high in the sky, watching. We got back in the car and drove east towards the buffer zone. On the other side, in Israel, the fields were furrowed with crops, but here, mainly grass and yellow wildflowers grew. The land that Muhammad al Dabla was farming was a rare exception. He was an older man, dapper in a brown vest and gray button-down shirt. He smoked a cigarette in a wooden holder, picking at the spines of a paddle cactus with his free hand. In 2009, Israeli planes dropped leaflets warning Gazans not to come within 300 meters of the border fence. The IDF, the flyers promised, would Eliminate anyone who will be found in the zone. Since you are warned, no excuses are accepted. The UN estimates that 30% of Gaza's arable land has been lost to the buffer zone. During the last war, the buffer zone, um, the buffer zone expanded to comprise 40% of the entire Gaza Strip. Israeli troops shoot on a daily basis, Al-Dabba said, as if he were talking about the weather. It depends how close we get. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you may know uh, Rachel Corey, who had gone to uh, Palestine as part of the International Solidarity Movement, the ISM. The founder of the ISM, Hueda Araf, uh, has written a beautiful essay in this book uh, about a time when she was in Palestine, but also about something that came before that. And again, uh, because you know, I picked everybody perfectly for uh, what they must read. Uh, Hueda is a fearless, slightly uh, crazy activist. And who better to read the words of Hueda Araf than this crazy activist from the Pioneer Valley, uh, uh, Joe Kamafer. <laughs> I'm also honored to be here and honored to read this beautiful passage um, in such a beautiful and important book. It's titled, um, This is Not the University of Michigan Anymore. Back in May 2002, a few weeks before I was due to get married, I led a group of internationals through the empty streets of Bethlehem under curfew and siege. Our destination was Manger Square, the Church of the Nativity, and our cargo was food, water, medicine, and solidarity. As I led the group into Manger Square, having navigated around a matrix of checkpoints, 
All I could see were Israeli soldiers and armored vehicles. We headed quickly for the door of the church, and I stood in front as others scampered inside to join the Palestinians under siege inside. Afterwards, I was detained and taken with the other internationals who did not enter the church to the Bethlehem Peace Center, where we were held at gunpoint. We linked arms and sat down, refusing to obey the soldier's orders when I heard above me a voice saying, this is not the University of Michigan anymore. I looked up and it took me a minute, but I recognized the officer looking down at me to be a former Jewish classmate with whom I had challenging but friendly political conversations in college. One who had joined my Arab Jewish dialogue group. Now he was standing above me in a military uniform, a gun slung over his shoulder with a disturbed look on his face. He wanted to know what happened to me. Why was I supporting terrorists? And I wanted to know why he left the United States to join a foreign army that was occupying the, the indigenous people of Palestine. My former classmate turned Israeli soldier was right. I wasn't in the University of Michigan anymore. And there was no room for dialogue about peace and coexistence without concrete action to end the colonial apartheid system that put me under his gun. Would he join me? Initially, I thought that I'd talk about the book right now, but I think it might be a good idea to have um, the readers read right through. And then I'll talk about the book, and then, then you can ask some questions, perhaps. Uh, but it, we wouldn't be here, of course, without Smith College uh, letting us be here. And the Smith College Students for Justice in Palestine uh, helped us get this room, for which we are very grateful. And uh, so, Kate, thanks a lot for uh, getting us the room here, and but Riyal Sabah is a student at Smith College, and she's going to read uh, from Najla Said's diary. Uh, Najla's diary was made up of her blog posts on Facebook during the Gaza War, and it was a beautiful, you know, painful read. Uh, you know, she wrote from the heart. Uh, she wrote, uh, you know, sometimes flailing about looking for language. And in that respect, uh, you know, I think she did a very successful job because I think many of us were flailing about looking for language. So uh, please come and share with us the words of Najla Saeed. Uh, July 21st, things you can do for less than today. Have gratitude for the roof over your head the food in your tummy and the water you have in abundance. Tell someone who is talking about the conflict that you have a Palestinian friend, and she is kind, and a pacifist, and she is not an anomaly among Palestinians. Let me, like Barack Obama and Mark Hebert, be clear. This is an unequal conflict. That does not mean that Israeli children huddling in staircases know the difference between their fear and any other fear. Their fear is legitimate, and it is as valid as yours and mine. Fear is fear, and Hamas needs to stop with the rockets. No one wins here. Okay, there's your both sides. But Gaza is a military-occupied territory, and Israel violates international laws every day, and has done so for 60 plus years. And Israel has an enormous army with sophisticated weapons. The numbers and images speak for themselves. I am a child of war myself, and thought I was never, and though I was never physically injured, I understand that there is no military solution to anything. But if everyone did stop fighting, Gaza would still be a prison for people whose only crime is being descendants of Ishmael and not Isaac. Now really, we made this all up. It's made up. We are all humans. Let's make up something happier and more beautiful and inclusive and move on. Don't know if that even makes sense, but oh well, I'm trying. July 22nd, nothing of importance. July 23rd. Is it weird that part of me thinks that Nelson Mandela's ascension to heaven was the last ingredient needed to form a solid coalition of peacemakers and justice seekers from history up there that has taken on the state of our miserable human existence and our horrific ways of treating others from their little cloud in the sky? I'm into it. It's fun to imagine and it's comforting to know there's a master plan, a coup if you will, a huge movement of resistors orchestrating the world's reordering with their brilliant minds and a little bit of heavenly magic. That's my brain for you. That's also my religion.
Thanks a lot. Um, I haven't had uh, many people read from the poetry in this book. Uh, the book is filled with poems. Um, poems written by veteran Palestinian American poets, poems written by young writers uh, finding their voice. Um, during the war, uh, I, you know, just as the war ended in August 2014, I wrote to uh, the Iraqi writer Sinan Antoun, who has written a beautiful novel called The Corpse Washer, which I recommend. Uh, it's a great novel. Uh, Sinan, uh, you know, is, is a poet of great sophistication. He won an award for his translations of Mahmoud Darwish, and I asked him to uh, produce something for the book. He wrote very fast and then said, I'm having a great difficulty with the end. And when he produced the end, it was stunning. So to help us read and share and feel the music of Sinan Antun, I'm happy to have uh, from Jackson Street School, Kim Gerald and her daughter Yamila Jean, who has spent a great deal of time in Egypt, in Jordan, in all those beautiful places. Please. Thank you, Vitya. This poem is called Afterwards. My father's warm palms shielded my ears. I could hear his blood racing in his veins, as if being chased by the bombs falling outside. My mother's lips fluttered like a terrified butterfly. She was talking to God and asking him to protect us. That's what she did the last war, and he listened. Her arms were clasped around my two sisters. Maybe God could not hear her this time. The bombing was so loud. After our house in Jebeliya was destroyed, we hid in the Onra school. But the bombs followed us there, too. And had found us. Mother and father lied. We didn't stay together. I walked alone for hours. They lied. There are no angels. Just people walking, many of them children. The teacher lied too. My wounds didn't become anemones, like that poem we learned in school says. Sidhu didn't lie. He was there, just as he promised me before he died. And he is there. I found him, leaning on his cane, thinking of Yafa. When he saw me, he spread his arms wide like an eagle, a tired eagle, with a cane. We hugged. He kissed my eyes. Are we going back to Yapa, Sidhu? We can't. Why? We are dead. So, are we in heaven, Sidhu? We are in Palestine, Habibi. And Palestine is heaven and hell. What will we do now? We will wait. Wait for what? To return. Thanks a lot. That was beautiful. So, I'm so happy. By the way, thank you everybody for reading from this book. Uh, it means a great deal to me. Uh, I hadn't actually planned to edit this book, um, and I didn't want to edit a book like this, except that when the war ended uh, last year, it seemed that once again there was going to be amnesia. Uh, and what was going to be forgotten was not merely the bombing, merely you know, the devastation. But what was going to be forgotten is that that nationality undergoes dispossession daily. You know, there is a daily dispossession. This is not something that happened in 1948. This happens every day. So I wanted to capture uh, emotionally the sense of that pummeling that now seems to happen every three or four years to Gaza. Uh, you know, there's this, this periodic and almost legal destruction of a part of the world that has come to symbolize the largest open air prison in the world. But at the same time, there's this everyday dispossession that takes place not only in the West Bank, not only in Gaza, but also within 48 Israel, and also among the diaspora. There is a sense of, I think, humanity that's always under threat. Uh, people uh, with such inflation 
experiencing uh, this feeling that Palestinians are terrorists. And therefore, that erosion of humanity, I felt we should somehow capture. And so, instead of having a book which gets into the argument whose terms have been set by the occupier and its greatest enabler, the United States, instead of getting into an argument about which area should be for Palestinians, which area should be for Israelis, instead of getting into an argument about security and terrorism, instead of getting into an argument about history and you know things that are so well argued over on terrain that has not been set by the people who are occupied, instead of all that, I thought, why don't we just write a book from the heart and see where this takes us? Why don't we short circuit the heart and the head and see if we come up with anything? You know, I no longer wanted to get into those discussions, those debates, where you know they're exhausting, they don't lead anywhere, and everybody's humanity gets, uh, I think, lessened in the sense that people who are on both sides of this, I think now, historic shouting match, uh, neither side enjoys this. Neither side seems to find any gain from it. Uh, I'm not interested in that. I'm more interested in reaching out to a population that is the American population, which I think has now come to understand that the one-sided uh, single narrative that it's been getting from the media is not sufficient. That in order to have a richer understanding, uh, you need to hear other people's voices. Now, there are many books of Palestinians telling their story. And somehow, for whatever reason, perhaps because of the erosion of the humanity of the Palestinian voice, I thought it would be more adequate for an American audience to listen to Americans, Arab Americans, Jewish Americans, non-Arab Americans, non-Jewish Americans. I thought Americans would be more likely to listen to Americans and see Palestine through their eyes. And perhaps then they might believe some of the things that other people are trying to tell them. So it's not the question that I wanted to edit a book where there were no Palestinian voices because I don't think Palestinian voices are important, quite the contrary. I did this strategically to bring other voices to the table in the hope that people who read and listen might take seriously things that the Palestinians have been saying for quite a long while. So that's the real reason why I wanted very much to have uh, American writers. And I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, we can talk in a little bit, but I want to say something about these writers. Some of these people are very famous and they have careers that they've made and none of the people that I approached hesitated to contribute to this book. Uh, I find this to be remarkable. Uh, there is a real sea change in the United States where I think there is a new openness uh, to listen to, to you know, uh, the details of uh, you know, events in the region. There's a new openness and I think we should embrace this openness. It happens that the political class is unable or doesn't yet know that there's this new openness. And the political class is still ready to be bullied by the lobbies, by the Israeli government, you know, by this and that and the other voice. And that's the political class. And in time, I think, this sea change uh, in the country is going to have an impact on the political class. But that time is not now. Because that political class is utterly deaf, uh, you know, stone deaf in any uh, event to what the population believes. Uh, many of you marched against the Iraq war in 2003. The political class utterly uh, ignored you. Uh, many of us have for years warned about the power of the banks. The political class entirely uh, ignored us. On this issue as well, despite the sea change, the political class is not going to take us seriously. We need to reach out to new audiences, to people who are not going to be uh, immediately, I think, drawn to the narratives that we are talking about. And for that reason, we need to reach out to new voices and new writers to speak boldly, where previously they have been, I think, uh, slightly cautious. There's no need to be cautious. Uh, you know, a writer doesn't write uh, sitting on their knees. Uh, writers should write standing up. And I was very happy uh, from the front uh, with Juno Diaz, 
uh, <laughs> with his very forthright statement about Americans being deranged about Palestine. Mm. So thank you so much for coming, and thank you uh, very much for supporting this book. I'm happy to have some questions, discussion, if you'd like, and then I'd like you to have a look at the book. So please, let's have a few minutes, if you'd like, of discussion. <laughs> you know, it's, I think, um, there's a very large group of the population, very large section of the American population, that I think would like to see alternative views of events around the world. I think there's a large section of the population that has come to understand that the United States cannot win seven wars, that the United States cannot keep enabling and supporting the militaries of Egypt and Israel and etc. Cetera and et cetera. You know, I think there are people who are fed up with that uh, understanding of supremacy. I know that the Republicans, for instance, haven't yet come to terms with the idea that you can't win seven wars. You know, they, they, they're going to run in this election with the view that you shouldn't just fight to contain, you should fight to win. You know, this is the Reagan legacy in the Republican Party. So you've got to fight to win. So where do you win? Well, you have to win in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, in Yemen, in Somalia, in Colombia, in Iran, you have to clobber the Palestinians a little more. In Russia, against Ukraine, I mean, it's apocalyptic. I think the Democrats, being the slightly weaker imperialist party in the United States, have had some understanding, and Obama, I think, is a really good example of this, that you can't win more than you know one or two wars, and maybe none. And so you back off, even from Afghanistan. So I think there's a broad public out there that would like to now hear other narratives, alternative ways forward in Afghanistan, alternative ways forward in Palestine. Unfortunately, the Palestinian case is a very dry case. It's arid. The uh, pathways forward are not easy to imagine. You know, the classical pathway of the two-state solution seems to have been eaten up by Israeli state policy. Um, the occupation cannot continue without, you know, the spiritual death of uh, the state of Israel and, of course, the actual corporeal death of the Palestinians. And the one-state solution is not possible for a large section of Israelis who would not want to live uh, in anything that's not a Jewish state. And demographically, a one-state may not be a Jewish state. But on the other hand, that third option is a beautiful option. Because, you know, after all, the United States is also a one state. And people are still able to articulate and develop their own cultural identities, religious identities. So I don't think there's a strict logic that says you need an ethno-nationalist state to protect, you know, tradition or culture. I think multi-national states are quite successful. So, you know, I think there's a broad public that would like to have these conversations. But every time we try to hold these conversations, it gets closed down. And I think the day of the conversation getting closed down is over. Please. Um, I'm not as hopeful as you are about the people that are waiting to hear the truth. Uh, except um, I'm, I'm holding some uh, cautious hope uh, because of the Black Lives Matter movement if they can stay, if they can survive whatever's trying to try to crush them. And I think they know that there's a connection between Palestine and what, I mean, it's parallel lives, really. So could you talk a little bit about that, um, I guess, what impact that might have on opening up uh, discourse for this country? That's a great question. And, and there's a very fine essay in here by Robin D.G. Kelly. Uh, the, the African-American historian from UCLA, who, by the way, wrote the best book, apparently. I'm not a jazz person, but I'm told his book on Monk is brilliant. But Robin's best, most beautiful book is called Freedom Dreams. And in many ways, I think he's as optimistic as I am about the world, temperamentally. This, by the way, one's temperament is never always a, rea a reflection of reality. Uh, I'm generally an optimistic person, despite the scum that surrounds us in the world. By scum, I mean the ideas, not people. Uh, um, 
So Robin's essay is beautiful because he connects the Ferguson issue with Palestine and does it, I think, quite straightforwardly. Um, he uh, brings back ideas like national liberation. You know, these are not liberal ideas. These are very strong ideas about people's assertions for dignity. Um, you know, right after um, Ferguson and, of course, after this last war, a group of Ferguson activists went on tour in Palestine. And one of the people who went with them was Mark Lamont Hill. And there's a video that you can watch of them, I think it's in Nablus, um, singing uh, you know, a, a civil rights song in the square in Nablus. It's a beautiful video. Um, you know, there is a very well-worked consciousness now. There's been a return of the idea of indivisible struggle. That means struggles here are related to struggles elsewhere. And I just hope this idea of indivisible struggle doesn't merely become rhetorical. You know, uh, you just need to chant these six slogans in every rally. It's a rally for healthcare, so we chant for black lives and for Palestine. And you know, that's, I don't think that's productive. I think we need to find concrete ways to uh, approach these struggles. And in that regard, I, I, I personally find the BDS campaign uh, to be the boycott, divest, sanctions campaign to be a concrete way to get involved. And I think that um, many of the people involved with that trip and other, otherwise in the African American uh, progressive community have been talking a lot about, uh, you know, somehow finding links to the BDS movement. Now I have to also say that the government of Israel is very shrewd and has uh, these very important campaigns that it runs uh, among, for instance, uh, African American uh, religious leaders and others where they come on tour. You know, just as Black Lives Matters goes on tour, uh, they also come on tour. And Robin writes about this other linkage from above. Um, you know, and this happens in many progressive American uh, movements, you know, uh, movements for, such as, for instance, for uh, gay rights. Uh, you know, there is what is known as, uh, you know, homo nationalism or pink washing where you know, uh, the claim is made that Israel is the only country in the Middle East that supports gays and lesbians. So uh, there are these very, I think, important things that the Israeli government is doing simultaneously to build international solidarity. One has to be aware of that. I think the question of people who, in the image I used in my introduction is, if you take a pillow and you suffocate somebody, you can't expect them to lie back and die. They will struggle. So if you take communities in the United States and you treat them with no dignity, when their grievances are not addressed at all, when you know they have hopelessness as the middle name of their children, uh, and then you expect them or you're dissatisfied with them not acting like liberals. It's an incredible assumption that people in power make. And it's the same assumption that people make every time there's a war in the Middle East. You know, why are the Palestinians fighting back? Well, when you put a pillow on somebody's face, they're going to try to kick you. And you can't assume that people who have been uh, treated without dignity are going to behave uh, in some kind of seminar discussion room. You know, uh, liberals uh, are made from a point of great privilege. Uh, liberals are not made uh, just by being born. Yeah. Since you brought up the uh, BDS, I heard this morning that uh, there's a bill that's uh, being pushed through Congress by uh, an amendment uh, congressman regarding penalizing uh, anybody like college campuses that support BDS, as well as uh, putting pressure on the European Union uh, not to go ahead and follow through. If you can talk a little bit about this bill and, and how is it going to affect BDS. So, uh, you know, this is not the first bill that they've tried to put forward. Uh, it's the first coming to Congress. Uh, there have been a number of other, uh, you know, pushbacks, as it were, uh, to delegitimize BDS. In Israel itself, there is, I think, a new apparatus to get people in trouble if they support uh, the boycott in any way. I mean, there was an article written, silly article in Hyatt's uh, against uh, Peter Beinart uh, about whether he's going to get into trouble for talking about boycott of the settlements. 
Um, you know, settlements are illegal by international law. The United States government sees them as illegal. Uh, you'd imagine then there should be no controversy over saying boycott settlement products. Because that's what the European Union boycotts. Uh, or at least uh, that's what uh, the standard they've set is the boycott of products that are produced in settlements. For instance, my personal favorite, soda stream. And so uh, when uh, this uh, is the standard, how can an American congressman put a bill through the US Congress which uh, chastises the Europeans for upholding the American standard? <laughs> but this is the nature of American politics. It's absolutely abysmal. You know, the, the logic is totally defeating to me. The fight against BDS, I think, uh, demonstrates the utility of this strategy. In other words, the government of Israel is seriously perturbed by the growth of BDS campaigns and the BDS movement. And I think for good reason. Uh, and I don't think we should understand BDS to be a campaign that act is actually supposed to hurt the Israeli economy. BDS is a campaign against the brand. That's what BDS is. It's an anti-brand campaign. It's just to say, when you think of you know, Israel or when you think of, um, you, know, uh, um, you know, let's say there was a book published a few years ago called Startup Nation about how Israel is you know, a tech society and such like. Well, you shouldn't be able to think about that without also thinking of the settlements or without also thinking about you know, the bulldozer that killed Rachel Corey. Th these things have to always be on mind. That's actually something deeply worrying for the state of Israel. This idea that BDS is going to damage the brand. So I think that that's what is worrying them. The European case is different because one of the things about Europeans is that they're not as hypocritical as the United States. You know, the United States says settlements are illegal, but then does nothing about it. You know, um, the Europeans say settlements are illegal, and then they say on settlement products, we're going to put stickers that say made in the settlement, which is, you know, better than American hypocrisy, but still hypocritical. Because if you say it's illegal, then you can't be importing the stuff. I mean, you know, then don't say it's illegal. So their hypocrisy is better than our hypocrisy. But at least it gives some space to have this discussion, uh, you know, where at least they're doing something which, you know, the American government now wants to put. So in other words, what I'm saying is that we have to always be vigilant about what these governments are doing. But none of this can stand any test in a court because they're utterly garbled and incoherent bills that the Republicans mainly, but supported heavily by the Democrats, have put to stop things like the BDS. They are so garbled that they'll never stand in court, and I therefore think that they'll never be able to actually pass Congress and become law. Because this is a little bit like the hallucinations about Iran. You know, a similar kind of, of, of absolutely incoherent politics. And I think in that sense, it shows that they are radical, but I don't think we should be scared. One more, maybe, and then you can have a look at this beautiful book. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much for coming, and I really hope you enjoyed the book. Thanks a lot.